Lynn, would you like to come and join me on stage? Can we invite our speaker up? Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Um, Glenn, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, Naomi, yeah, what, what are the kind of important bits just now? I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I'm a grandfather. Um, I was, uh, until I retired, a psychiatrist. Um, so I was at medical school up in Scotland, went down to Bristol to study psychiatry, back up to Nottingham, back down to Bristol where I ended up uh, a professor of psychiatry in, in the university department at Bristol. So uh, that, that, that's my kind of story in a nutshell, I, yeah. I guess. Great, thank you. And, and what are you excited about for this week here? Well, I mean, thanks so much for coming. It, it's amazing uh, to be here. And um, the, the most important bit of my story I, I didn't mention in the last bit, which is that I've been a, a follower, of, a Jesus follower, uh, most of my life. And uh, so, the, so I'm really pleased to be, to be here this week because uh, being able to share... Uh, something about him, and, and I guess, too, take some of the stuff I learned and wrestled with in psychology and psychiatry and relate that to what it means to be a Christian. It's been a great privilege for me over the past uh, few years since I stepped down from full-time uh, work as an academic psychiatrist. So that's it. Great. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Well, I mean, huge subject, uh, identity. Um, when being myself isn't enough. I think almost everybody must have uh, heard of the Bourne franchise of films. I guess almost everybody must have seen at, at least one of them. They're repeated on the television often enough, for goodness sake. But in the first movie, if you remember, the Bourne identity, uh, we encounter Jason Bourne, wounded, clinging on to his life, fished out of the sea by uh, a passing boat, and totally amnesic. And the question the film sets up for us, for the whole series, is who is Jason Bourne? And, and that's the story that, that, that we embark on, that he embarks on. He, 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 he's got nothing to go on but, but a Swiss bank account number uh, stitched into his skin. He soon discovers he's got the world-class skills of, of a spy, a combat skills of a, of a spy. And, and then he discovers that there are people who, who want him dead. But why? What are those skills for? Who is Jason Bourne? And I guess if you, if you think about it, Bourne's dilemma is, is a cameo, a picture of, of our human dilemma. We emerge into a world not of our own making, but who are we? What, why are we here? Uh, we've got skills and strengths. You've got amazing skills and strengths, but what are they for? There's nobody out to, you hope, to kill you, but death is coming. And, and the reality is that some of us will die sooner than we ever dreamed. Most of us will go right on into the, the future. But however long we live, death is coming for us. Why? What, what's it for? Who are we? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Because the reality is in three or four generations, no one will remember who you were. Who are we? It's a big question. It's a question that, 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 that kind of takes you looking up to the stars. And it's a question that shrinks right down from up there, down here, into Durham, at this table, on this seat, with this sense of, of being embodied and being me and all the feelings and the experiences right now. Who am, who am I right now, here, on earth? And it's a big, big question. And, and here I am, back in a university, which, which, which I think is a marketplace of ideas. Hope it is, anyway. Fantastic place to exchange ideas and to be curious and look into things. And here I am in this marketplace of ideas. And I, I've just come and I'm setting up my stall. And, 
And I don't want to shout anyone else down. There are lots of other stalls in this place. I don't want to shout anyone else down. I don't want to close them down. I hope they won't want to shout me down or, or close me down. We want to have a conversation to look in some of these, some of the most important questions you will ever ask in your life. And we're kicking off today. Who am I? Why am I here? What does it mean to be me? No wonder the New York Times, 2015, ran a big piece. It was headed 2015, the year we obsessed about identity because there's so much confusion, isn't there? But look, before going any further, let's, let's just get a couple of things clear. What is identity? I mean, that itself is a big question. If you're a psychologist, we talk about... Um, Eric Erickson's one of the big names. Um, if, if you're a sociologist, Robert Bella would want to talk about. If you're a philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, Charles Taylor, Alastair McIntyre. There, there's so much to... But, but, but shrinking it down, what, what does it mean for us to have a personal identity? Well, you see, we, we human beings, we're, we're curious creatures. We, we come into the world prime to ask questions. It's the way we are. It's the way we seem to be made. What's that? What's this? How does that work? And unique amongst all of the animals, we not only ask questions of the world, we ask questions of ourselves. Who, who am I? What, what's this? What am I for? And quite simply, Identity is the answer we give to that question. It's the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Of course, if you think about the story of, of your life so far, the, 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 there's lots of different bits to it. And, the, and there'll be more and more bits as your life goes on. There's your age and your sex and your social status. There's your education and your future job. There's your sexuality and your relationship commitments. There's your passions and interests and ambitions. And a personal identity takes all of these different parts and it says, here are the headlines. This is who I am. This is the superordinate to which all these other bits are subordinate and they're in some way shaped by them and given by it and given meaning. So that's my kind of I, I, idea about identity. It takes all the different parts, says these are the headlines. It's the hub that holds the spokes together. It's the plot line of the story of your life. It's what makes you tick. Why does it matter? It's the other thing I want to get at. Well, what is it? But, but why does it matter? Why are we here kind of thinking about it? Well, of course, because if you haven't got an inner core, if, if you haven't got some hub, if, if there are no headlines, then you're like a, a rudderless ship tossed about in a storm behaving this way one day and another way the next, believing one thing today and another thing tomorrow. Nothing to give ballast or stability to your life. No sense of direction, no goals. Nobody can live like that. As philosopher Matthew Crawford put it, without the ability to direct our attention where we will, that is an ability that comes from having this inner core, we become captive to those who would direct our attention where they will. And there are a lot of folk out there who want our attention. You can't be a vegan one day and out fox hunting the next. Well, you could, I, I suppose. But your friends would be confused, wouldn't they? Identity gives shape and stability to our values as well. You're out this afternoon in a local supermarket with what you thought was your best friend. And out of the blue, she picks up a bottle of gin, looks around, and slips it in her bag. And then she gives you a conspiratorial wink and, and nods for you to do the same. No one's looking. You had no idea she did this. 
But, but what, what are you going to do now? Most of us, I hope, quick as a flash. We don't even think about it. We don't do, do a, 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 an ethical evaluation of this situation. Quick as a flash, it comes out of deep, out of who we are. We say, no, I'm sorry, that isn't who I am. Shoplifter. So personal identity, this inner core brings stability and coherence to our lives. It says, this is who I am and, and this is what I'm about. It's important. But there's a problem here, isn't there? On, the problem is this. On what or on whom do I base my identity? What, what, what is out there? What is in here that, that's so important that, that, that it can act as the anchor point for, for my life and, and shape my world? With all the stuff going on in our lives, what is the hub? It, it, is it my social class? My political convictions? Is it my nationality, my gender, my sexuality, my race? What, what is the headline for, for me? What, there's so much to ch choose. It's never been an easy question to, to answer. But in a fast-changing world, it's so much harder, isn't it? And I think there are two approaches in play in our, in our culture about what you base your identity on. First, you, you can look out. You can look out and get your identity from your social position. Y you know, your, your, where you are in the pecking order. What you've achieved and the labels that come with that and the privilege that comes with that. And you say, yeah, this is who, this is who I am. And, uh, you know, provided you strike lucky, um, staking your identity on, on, on a privileged status can, can deliver some great outcomes. Lord of the manor, privileged white middle class professional woman, privileged male in a patriarchal culture. On the face of it, these kind of identities from social position should be, should be stable. But, but even social positions like these are, are not <clears throat> set in concrete, are they? Cultures change. The mighty fall. Things shift in, in your life, and suddenly people don't care anymore where you came from. They want to know where you're going to and who you are and what it is that makes you tick. They don't care who your parents were. And the Me Too movement suddenly emerges, and the mighty sitting on their perches are cast down. And Kevin Spacey, now who are you? Who are you? So, so you can't rely on, on where you sit in the, in the pecking order in terms of where you come from. The alternative is to work for your status and base your sense of self on your achievements. You know, um, when I was a kid, I was about, well, I was 11. And I sat something called the 11 plus exam. There's still, it still happens to a few folk who, who are in certain grammar school areas. Anybody here sat the 11 plus exam? Wow, look at that. OK, I failed it once. Who failed it once? Yes, well done, that man. We are a small but elite band of people. But I, I failed it twice. Anybody fail it twice here? Yeah. Anyway, my, after I, I was distraught because we were a really working class family. And I had my heart set on being a doctor. And this was the binary. This is the dividing of the ways. This says where you go in life, at least in the 50s, 60s, when well, I took it. And I was distraught. And my grandmother took me aside. And she said, but you know, Glenn, our kind of people... I mean, it's a great idea being a doctor, but our kind of people don't do that kind of thing. That is our identity. That is what Ralph Linton, the sociologist, called your ascribed identity. It's what culture, it, it's, it's what it ascribes you and tells you where you sit. Well, thankfully for me, I had a, 
um, a family that, that's in that. Other people in the family said, no, it's not like that. We work. We keep going. And I worked and I kept going. And on the face of it, you see, here's a kid at the bottom rung of a ladder, now a professor in a university achieving status and respect, not because of my breeding, but because of my achievement. Isn't that something to stake my identity on? No one can take that away. It's what I did. <laughs> Or is it? Or is it? What happens when I get old? Hey, I am old. I, I mean, what happens when you, you get disabled suddenly in your 20s, 30s? And all that you work for, pe other people, the speed, I tell you, for it, the speed at which other people will move on in your life and leave you behind, do not underestimate that. Those people who you relied on their approval, and what they gave you, and what you earned from them. And then suddenly you work for something that, that nobody wants your particular skill anymore. And there are no more jobs left like that, and you're out. Now who am I? I mean, I can't, I can't remember I achieved that, but nobody else does, and doesn't seem to count for much more. And, and of course, the social media world makes this, makes this whole area of status so much bigger, doesn't it? The sphere in which we achieve status has shifted from the, from the, from the real world in a way to a social media world of being liked. And the problem, of course, in a hyper-connected world is you're only as liked as long as your last tweet. And before you know where you are, someone else it seems to be liked more. And they're shinier and better than you, so you're back on the treadmill, earning approval, earning recognition. And how do you get off this thing? Who am I? Where's a sense of ballast, a sense of... Where, where's something, a foundation that I can root my life on that isn't out, out there? Of course... That's one way. The other approach in our culture is to say, uh, no, no, don't, 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 race, don't base who you are on, on your achievements or on, on where you came from. Look inside yourself. Just be true to yourself. Look, look deep within. It's called expressive individualism. Robert Bella coined that term, the sociologist. Madonna sang, I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. What not to like? On the face of it, no one can take away who you are. So you be you. Be who you are. It's everywhere around us, isn't it? Every Disney film, that's the core message, is be who, who you are. And there are two big problems with expressive individualism. First, what if you look inside yourself and the you you find is filled with doubt and fear? And, and then life turns dark and hard, and you try the formula, you be you. I'm just going to think positively. I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. And, and it, it feels better for a few moments, but then you open your social media account or you visit a shopping mall and you're bombarded with images that says, being you, it isn't enough. You want to be in the world of, look around you. They, these people are all smarter than you. They're better dressed than you. They're shinier. They're more attractive. They've achieved so much more. And you see, this terrible philosophy of life is telling you that when life gets hard, you're on your own. You're on your own. And, and then second, the expressive individualism, just look inside, hey, you be you. Sounds great, but, but it, it's also saying be honest about yourself. Be honest about what's inside. You see, when I look inside myself, if I'm, if I'm honest, shall I be honest with you, I see some seeds of greatness in there. I think there's some things I'm really good at. I think I was a good teacher. I, I did some good research. 
and I've got a set of skills now. I, I think just like you, every one of you, I hope you feel a sense of your greatness, your giftedness, your uniqueness. Because I sense that inside myself. In a way, that, that's what leads me to talk about this. I hope that's what's brought you here. Who am I? I sense something about myself, and I do. But then I look a bit closer at all those things inside. And I see a big crack running through it all. Not just one crack, more cracks. A bit like a windscreen mirror. The cracks seem to spread right across through who I am. What am I talking about? I'm talking about when, when I spoil my friendships with jealousy, pride. I'm talking about making promises I didn't keep. I'm talking about wanting to get even. I really do want to get even at times. And sometimes I like it when other people fail. You know that in yourself? You like it. You do. And, and I, I say, you want me to be true to myself? Because I see meanness inside at times, and I see selfishness, and the need to have things go my way, and you say, be that person, I don't think you'd really like it if I really was that person. Heinrich Himmler, hey, you be you. He was. And the destruction reek was, was terrible. And, and we, we all have these cracks running deep inside us. And it's our biggest problem. And the Bible calls it sin. So I'm left asking, is there something for, for me to build my identity on with stronger foundations that, than out there or in here? And um, something that wants me to be real about my, myself, yes, but then doesn't leave me dangling in the wind and that says, well, that's all you've got yourself, mate. Christian faith, rooted in the teaching of the Bible, it's got a lot to say about being honest about yourself. It really has. Jesus of Nazareth, who we're talking about this week, I hope you'll be curious about him. He, he's full of surprises. Come tonight, learn about some of the surprises in his life. That's what we'll be, we'll be kicking off with. But he had a lot to say about being real about yourself. You know, he took on the powerful religious leaders of his day. In front of crowds of people, he called them out and he said, you are whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside. And inside you are rotten people. And the ordinary folk, when they saw how he took on the religious police and the racketeers and the oligarchs, they cheered him on, not least his own disciples, his followers. They thought this was just great until he turned and he looked at them. And you could read this in Matthew 7, one of the books written about, about him. And he, he looked at them and he said, hey, hang on. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You hypocrites. His own, these are his own disciples. He says, look... Don't, don't call them out without prepared to call yourself out. First take the plank out of your own eye, for in the same way, he said, you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use on others will be measured to you. Be real. So to wrap up, is, is there any way of thinking about ourselves that can bring a foundation and give shape to our lives. Back to Jesus, just for a moment. He had a profound effect on everybody he met, Jesus. And I, I wonder if, if you've got one of, these, one of these things. It's Mark's eyewitness account of Jesus' life. I just want to read two verses, and then we're done with a quick word after that. And it's on page four. Just grab it. Mark's Gospel, page 4, and I'm looking at verse 16 of chapter 1 
on page four. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. And at once, they left their nets and followed him. And when he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat as well, preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. And, and they left Zebedee, their father, in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Two brief points, and then come and hear more about this from Vaughan tonight. First, when Jesus looks their way and says, follow me, these, these ordinary guys, these fishermen, not, not high in the pecking order, he looks their way, he says, follow me. The point to get is that he takes them as they are. He wants them as they are. He accepts them as they are. He says yes to them. Yes to them. It's precious human beings just where they are. In a word, as they'll soon discover, in spades, he loves them. And this is the first point about what the Christian story has to say about identity. Christian for the Christian, identity is, is formed out of God's love for us, which is unconditional. It's always there. It is, is without limit. And that's the first point. Follow, follow me. I, I want you. And it's a love that will take his own son, Jesus, to the cross. But second, here's the point. His love accepts them as they are. Yes. He says yes to them. But but it doesn't leave them as they are. He says, follow me and I will make you men fishers. And I'll send you out fish for men. I will revolutionize your life, turn it upside down, and you'll have a new identity. A new identity as a Jesus follower. It's what I am. That's my identity. A Christian an identity that it doesn't paper over the cracks of my, of my life. It, Jesus, Jesus will, and he didn't paper over the cracks of these disciples. Jesus will confront them with the planks in their own eyes, as we've seen. He's going to call out their mixed motives, their lust for status and power. He's going to call it out. And, and when they eventually abandon him and deny that they ever knew him, their tendency to screw things up is going to be laid bare for the whole world to see. And we read about it today. And they saw it most of all. They screwed it up. And this is who they are. So, so this identity doesn't paper, over the, doesn't paper over our human propensity to screw things up that the Bible calls sin. It doesn't paper over it says, yes, God loves us like, like that. But then it doesn't leave us as they are because it takes us to, to the cross that Jesus died on and it says, forgiven. Our sins laid on him. His life somehow mysteriously becomes our lives and so we're called Christians, Christ followers. That's who I am. And now it's the headline. It determines everything about me. Well, we could say so much more. I hope that's just whetted your appetite to, to be curious, to, to think more about, about this man we call Jesus and maybe come again tonight. So I'm going to, Naomi, come back up and... Uh, see what time we've got left, if any. Yeah, um, we did start um, quite a bit later than we hoped to. Um, we apologise for that, and tomorrow we'll try to um, figure out a way of getting everyone through a bit faster so we can be on time. But we do only have a um, time for a couple of questions now. Um, another thing to flag up is, you probably noticed that halfway through we 
we're fiddling around with the screen over here. We had put up slightly wrong number. Um, so if you, it, it's just it's just that the last the last digit we put up a five. It's actually a four, which it is now. And if you texted in in the first ten minutes while the original one was up, and you want to send in, you want to forward it onto the correct one. Um, I'd love to know who's do that. Those texts, <laughs> I know. I feel bad. <laughs> um, but thankfully, we do still have have texts on this. That's a good point. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll ask a couple of questions from here, um, and then and then we'll we'll break, and you guys can head over to your lectures. Um, so the first question, Glenn, is um, how will Jesus shape my identity? Won't I just lose my individuality? Mm, that's a great. It's a great question. It's kind of um, you know, doesn't this erase who I am? And because I'm a Christ follower, and following Christ means you become more like Him. Kind of, I lose. I, I lose my own kind of identity. And, and, and I think the genius of, of, of the Christian gospel, Jesus said, uh, if you're prepared to, to lose your life, then you'll find it. Um, something else he said was, seek God's kingdom first, and all these other things will be yours as well. And the genius of the gospel is that the more you give yourself away, the more you've find yourself it's just almost an existential experience that the more you follow Jesus the more you feel yourself and this is this is mostly to do with the fact that God's work in us when we become Christians with all the cracks is is he begins to put us back together again it's a lifelong work Christians here will tell you they blow it all the time it they stumble and they fall and they slip and they slide, and then they have to keep going again. So it's a journey, but it's a journey in which God begins to put us back together again so that we, we inhabit our calling as, as creatures made in his image. And that's why you sense your greatness. You, you know there's something about you, and it's because you're made in his image. But it's the cracks that prevent us from, from becoming who we truly are as bearers of the divine image. So I just want to say, I don't know, it's, it's not a perfect answer because there's a mystery about it. But, but, but the more you become and, and seek to be like him in character, the more in your own personality you, you have a sense of being centered. And you certainly have a sense of your gifts being called to serve some cause that's bigger than yourself. Great, thank you, Glenn. And one, one more from the phone. Um, if you do want to kind of discuss that, um, that with Glenn, then you can always come back um, afterwards and chat with him. Yeah, and we go, um, I'd love to just come and grab me at any time. Yeah. And uh, we have an extended time of questions for those who can stay. At the yeah, end. exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, this one is, um, when it comes to identity, are we not just a product of those things around us through nurture? Um, it's not actually an active choice, but just what happens to us. And I, I personally would just include in that, where does that leave us if we've just been brought up in a Christian family as well? Yeah, um, you've got to face this. We are powerfully influenced by our genetic, social, cultural environment and the way these interact together. Uh, the problem is that question, if this is true, was also determined by the environment. And the answer I'm giving is also determined by the environment, and we're not having a conversation at all. It's all determined by nature and by nurture and all the other things. And so we, we come to this question of, can we choose as human beings? And I believe we, we can. It's the only way we can live. No one can live like, like that. Um, but, but we have to take into account the fact that we are influenced by our environment by our genetic makeup, that they do set boundaries around what we can do and what we can achieve. We've got to accept that. But within that, there's still huge scope for growth and change and everything to play for.